Kaustav, let's start the session in a minute. So we'll start around like 7 4. Kindly be ready. Okay, um, I think we can go ahead. It's seven four on seven four, and still letting people are joining, so let them join as the session continues too. So first of all, I'm very excited and a warm welcome to all of you who have come, like join from India as well as you guys, Europe. I think we have a lot of diverse attendees here. Uh, thank you so much for joining this session. So myself, I'm Karthik, and I'm the co-founder and chapter lead of Neurotech X India. So NDX India is as Neurotech X is an international neurotechnology community with a mission to advance the progress of neurotechnology worldwide. And in India, it's a very recently initiated chapter. We started around like it's, it's around one year old. We started in August 2022, and we've had some successful events in the past, including webinars where we have hosted uh, Dr. David Eagleman, and uh, we've hosted some professors from IITs. And yeah, it's, uh, and we have also had people like Ryan Field from Kernel. And now we have like uh, Kaustub, like who has possibly worked in Neuralink and hope it's going to be very, very interesting. So in, at NDX India, we have a mission of advancing the progress of neurotech in India. And uh, regarding that, we're trying to create this platform and bring in events, webinars to create awareness about neurotech, and also trying to uh, integrate clinicians, professors, students, researchers in India to create a very vibrant and an ambitious ecosystem in India for the growth of neurotechnology. So with that, with no uh, further delays, I'd like to introduce all of you to our guest speaker. I'm very excited to introduce Kaustub. Kaustub is a senior MEMS engineer and a neurotech enthusiast specializing in flexible neural probes. He began his research in chronic paralene probes at CMU and went on to work with leading neurotech companies like such as Neuronexus Technologies and uh, as we all know, Elon Musk's Neuralink where he worked around like one to one and a half years and where he worked basically on silicon and polyamide uh, probes based high bandwidth computer brain computer interfaces and his ambition so after working there, he came back to India and his ambition is to help people in Asia uh, from where he aims to work and la learn with neurotechnology experts to help leapfrog this technology to the potential that it holds. I recently got an opportunity to talk to my friend Kausto and we shared a lot of insights on the growth of neurotech and he had a lot of interesting perspectives and I thought definitely we should invite him to our NDX webinar. So with no further delays, yeah, thank you so much Kausto and uh, yeah, excited to welcome you. The stage is yours. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, I'm yeah. I'm excited to be part of this uh, part of this mission by Neurotech X, and also we're just overwhelmed seeing so many potential Neurotech experts and uh, enthusiasts. I hope my presentation today excites you and then does uh, imbibe some sort of enthusiasm towards Neurotech, towards invasive BMI, and also just the efforts that we're putting in uh, and how they can be clinically translated. Uh, with that, I'd like to start my presentation. Uh, we can usually I, I go for about thirty minutes, but if if uh, it gets a little tiring, uh, do don't hesitate to to tell me to take a break, and then maybe we can just take a two or three minute respite. Uh, with that, let's let's begin. So my presentation today is going to be on intracortical neural probes. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Karthik. But uh, it just recently my co-founder. Arjun, Professor Arjun Ramakrishnan at IIT Kanpur and I have started a company in India that manufactures invasive neural probes. Uh, Arjun's kind enough to be on, on this call as well, uh, spending his Saturday evening with us. And uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about the history of intracortical neural interfaces, uh, IBMIs, and the potential applications for those, uh, and including uh, those in India and what the potential uh, really is. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about my company and what we do and how our technology and the collective technology in the world can help uh, better the state of neurotech today and at the end of the day help someone. So right now, uh, okay, just to confirm, Karthik, you can see my screen, right? Yes, Kaustab, is it visible? It's okay. visible. Okay, great. Great, great, great. So what I'm sharing with you right now is uh, you, you'd think is a complex mesh of ones. 
but in actuality, it's just a rat's brain. And a rat is, is one of the tiniest and most simple organisms, you know, animals in this world to study. And despite that, if we are to figure out how a rat brain works, it's such a complex task because you can see how convoluted and complicated the wiring in its brains is. And really, if this is how complex a rat brain is, a brain is going to be way more complex. So the, the point of Neurotech today is we need to harness the potential of the brain, just like in any electrical appliance, which communicates in terms of electrical signals. Our brain communicates in terms of electrical signals as well. We use something called action potentials, which get fired, our neurons fire them, and then those get communicated through the brain, through the neurons, to the spine, and then distributed to the muscles to perform certain actions. And just like you would fix an electrical appliance to study, you know, if you want to fix the brain and treat people with medical, uh, mental degenerative disorders, you need to figure out what the wiring is in the brain. And to do so, you need really tiny tools that can, that can allow us to read and record the currents flowing in between the neurons and then the voltages uh, at, at the terminals. So the mission today of, of the Neurotech scenario is to build an intimate extension of ourselves. If we can harness the, the potential that our brain has and allow it to interface with the computer, we can really, we can truly be the very definition of an Android. It's no longer just a smartphone, but we and the smartphone can be a, a, a synergistic unit. So in just in India today, Mental degenerative disorders account for the second highest disease uh, and death burden, and it's very unfortunate because uh, there's not a lot of research that is that that has happened in the past, uh, primarily because there were lack of tools to study the brain. So, just to give you a historical analogy, in 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 the late 12th and 13th century, uh, alchemy was quite popular. And people believed that animals and humans uh, worked on a mixture of chemicals, and that's what they thought the brain does too. Uh, cut to the 16th or the 17th century where the industrial era began uh, and the gears were invented. People were thinking of the brain as having micro gears and, and chains and levers which, which tug and pull and allow certain actions to happen. It is only in the 19th and the 20th century that people figured out that this is an electrical phenomena. But how do you measure it? The brain is just a tissue that's folded onto itself and the neurons are so tiny, they're, they're invisible to the naked eye. And that's primarily why the, the research hasn't taken off up until 50 years ago. Uh, consequently, because we can't study the brain, we can't treat disorders like chronic pain, seizures, Parkinson's, epilepsy. But there have been certain, uh, certain clinical uh, landmarks, landmark medical technologies, which have treated the symptoms, if not the disorder completely. Just today, for the government, uh, the, the total economic burden to treat and to, to protect people with mental degenerative disorders is 68 billion rupees. That's not a, that, that's, that's a massive amount, that's a significant amount. Uh, and 35 million people in India, this was the stats from 2015, so I'm sure there are a lot more by now, but they've been living with neurological and psychiatric disorders. Uh, and it's unfortunate because these disorders can be treated uh, and it's, it's just our mission to, to get there and help these people. So some of the, 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 the landmark uh, medical technologies that have been accepted widely are uh, ECOGs for uh, epilepsy, treating epilepsy using stimulation, deep brain stim for treating Parkinson's, uh, EEGs and means can be used for treating or at least helping with depression, uh, urinary incontinence, uh, cochlear implants have been popular since the 90s, retinal implants these days, this company called Second Side in California, which is which is commercialized retinal implants, allow uh, people born with blindness to partially see uh, images around. So, I, you know, with, with, with the technologies that have already been accepted, us at A1 Neuro and people around the world who've been manufacturing invasive neural probes can help treat 15 million pa patients right away and just take their suffering away, allow their uh, lifestyle condition to be much better. But where do we start? There are your starting point, right? And this the single unit of, of the brain is a neuron. So we have to understand the brain and to understand the body and the functions that it performs. We have to start from right from deciphering a neuron to deciphering a group of neurons to, to a brain lobe, to signals in the spinal cord and then eventually in the muscles. And those different signals that, that researchers today study right from single units, which are emanated from neurons to LFPs, which are superposition of different multi-unit activities uh, to alpha waves, delta waves, and EEG, and then finally EMG, which are uh, electrical recordings from our muscles. 
uh, just what I previously said, there's the different types of signals that can be recorded and that can be used to help treat a patient. Uh, and it depends from, it varies in terms of the invasiveness. So let's start with EEG, which is which uses surface uh, recordings. It's above the scalp. Uh, and sometimes people shave off the hair, sometimes people tend to keep the hair, but it's, it's fairly non-invasive. Uh, it's a little heavy and a little cumbersome, but still it gives us certain readings which are, which are uh, workable, which, are, which you can use to decipher a certain activity. But you can see from the signal on the right that it's, it's very difficult to process these signals and the spatial resolution is quite poor. So researchers then move to something called as uh, electrocorticography or ECOGS. These are kept below the, the bone, so below the skull and just on the surface of the brain. These have fed, allowed us to understand the brain, even read information from, from brain lobes. And the signal processing for it is slightly better uh, in, terms of, in terms of figuring out which part of the lobe does what. Uh, finally, invasive probes, which are really tiny wires, which can go in and, and record, just like a multimeter. They're able to record local field potentials and extracellular action potentials or single units. Uh, and you can see from these signals, it allows us to account for better spatial and temporal resolution. So if you if you have an algorithm that matches, that uses some sort of uh, filtering for, for a specific signal that's pertaining to an activity, you can now study cause and effect relationships uh, in, in, in a brain and what a human does. And all of these require different tools. So EGs require silver, silver chloride electrodes, the stainless steel dry electrodes. ECOGs again use, use uh, different things for manufacturing. And then to make really invasive tiny neurotropes, you need uh, uh, something, a technology called as MEMS or thin film manufacturing, microfabrication. Uh, this technology was adopted from semiconductor manufacturing developed by Intel and commercialized in the last hundred years, but it takes certain aspects and then it further builds on to make mechanical as well as electrical components on a silicon wafer. But to this day, this is the research that we've been doing and it really shows how much we've been able to, or how vast of a, of, of a problem we're trying to figure out, we're trying to solve. Uh, and to do so, I think we need the right set of tools because there are, there are ample amount of uh, researchers working on this. And just like the Human Genome Project, which started in the early 90s, there's uh, the Obama administration announced the Human Connectome Project, which will allow researchers across the world to collect data and to understand how, or just map the human brain. To delve into the history of neural probes a little, uh, it, this is just to give you a perspective and, and how this field even ventured into, into what it is today. So we started off with, you know, it, what is a multimeter? At the end of the day, it's just a single wire. So you can put you can put a cloth hanger in the brain and still record activity. Probably not the best idea, but the whole effort in the last 20 years was to miniaturize a microwire and have as many microwires and as, as small as a footprint as possible. So uh, from history, this is collected by Jamie Hetke at Texas Technologies, but we, they started off with making silicon arrays because silicon was what was used for the semiconductor manufacturing and it was a simple substrate material to, to use. But so in 1996, uh, they made multi-shank uh, electrode implants. Uh, there were retinal implants. This, this was the early work that was done uh, by researchers who were associated with second sight. And then this technology was eventually commercialized to make retinal implants. But you can see that some of the dimensions on here, the electrodes are fairly large. Uh, and such large features were, the research was to, to, to make them smaller and miniaturize them smaller so that you could get more spatial resolution and record from as many neurons as possible. Uh, and another uh, cool research was from Simon Fraser University in the mid nineties. This was to record from peripheral nerves where you had a hook to, for a researcher to latch onto and with a needle to poke the, the, the peripheral nerves and record activity from them. And a lot of the work was done on silicon, but unfortunately researchers realized that silicon has, does not have as good of a clinical translation as, as other materials would because silicon is brittle and it's toxic to the human body. So the research from the mid nineties then pivoted to give way for organic polymers or alternate materials, which are not just biocompatible, but biostable as well. But talking about BMIs and not just electrodes, in 1969, this was a pioneering study by a professor, famous professor uh, called, named Fetz. He's still working, so you can, you can uh, tell how dedicated he is to his work. But in the 1969 paper by Ebhard Fetz, he, was, he managed to figure out that monkeys 
could voluntarily control the firing rates in in their brain uh, when they were given when they were awarded with uh, food and with that he realized that if a monkey can control its firing rates and can control the neural pace humans could too so in in degenerative disorders where uh, certain pathways neural pathways degenerate or, or uh, don't work or uh, fire too much there is a possibility for for human biology to avert those those pathways and make new, new pathways consequently helping treat some of the diseases that are out there and even with some uh, medical device intervention this is absolutely possible and this was one of the pending research that happened in 1969 which paved way to invasive bmis becoming a reality and isn't it really cool like imagine you know as a child like i always tried to you know store that you you only use 20% of your total brain power and i thought if maybe i have control over it and i used to shut my eyes and think hard uh, didn't succeed <laughs> but uh, you know see, seems like seems like professor fetz did and then very exciting work that that eventually ensued cut to 2006 where brain gate this born company born out of brown university was able to pioneer technology uh, where they actually implanted an electrode interface coupled it with a decoder to understand the neural signals and then have some sort of a sensory feedback and output mechanism the, the output mechanism being the robotic arm and it's amazing to see because this image is is part of history today uh, this lady with the uta array these these are single tank electrodes made we call them the bed of nails but these are made on a silicon substrate these are implanted in this lady and the, the researchers at brown were control a robotic arm uh, for for her to to control and feed her just eventually it was just a sip of water but this was pioneering work and this made history a couple of years down the line universities uh, such as university of pittsburgh uh, university of california at san, san francisco they did these human studies too and they eventually found out that you could push more and you could put these devices into other areas in the brain and and get uh, good results so eventually the the whole idea is to to improve condition of living and also provide therapy to people suffering uh, this was a recent study on the bottom right the image that you see on the bottom right was a recent study where two individuals with uh, tetraplegia so their their arms and legs uh, are paralyzed they were able to communicate with just their thoughts on whatsapp and that is amazing uh, even even as an able bodied person if i could do that that would be remarkable uh, and this is lets you appreciate how much how much this field has grown and how much there is how much potential there is in this field uh, so but right now we're still limited to the primary motor cortex so the primary motor cortex is an area in the brain that allows motion control uh, and it's it's fairly it, it's studied fairly well so a lot of researchers continue to push uh, push push research uh, in that direction but there are other regions of the brain deeper regions of the brain which can help with more therapeutic uh, applications so oh, i'm seeing chat here uh, kartik other questions coming in or uh no oh, no uh, okay okay Request. all right cool since i think cool, cool, cool. Uh, i mean the audience can directly switch on their video and audio and then ask you directly awesome awesome so if anyone does have questions feel free to interrupt this is a this is an informal conversation uh, and and i'd be happy to answer any questions uh, all right cut to cut to new electrodes that that are that are present today uh, these are some of the images and some of the companies that are working on cool solutions unique solutions uh, and not just silicon microwaves on the top left you can see polymer array this is an ecog array that was made by uh, university of wisconsin at madison and they were able to use these flexible polymers uh, and and biocompatible and non-cytotoxic polymers to enable chronic recordings from from uh, a monkey and this uh, is quite a pivotal study because since 1998 there's been a lot of work done on polymer and both arjun and i today are even at furthering this work by by uh, making our own polymer but i'll get to that part later another solution that we, so the unique part about this solution was they were able to put multiple electrodes on a single shank now it's it's important to do so because when you when you insertion when you do an implantation you don't want to do too many surgeries because that causes trauma to the body and there's always neuronal death around the site of implantation so if you have multiple electrodes uh, present on a single shank you're able to now figure out more activity from a smaller surgical footprint Uh, and that's a disadvantage of of the second electrode strategy which which was pioneered at university of utah and now commercialized by a company called blackrod microsystems these are essentially a bed of silicon nails with uh, iridium oxide as their electrode material they are uh, i would say 
pushed into into the brain there is some some uh, biological damage but uh, these have shown excellent promise in terms of uh, chronic lifetime and these are the ones that were implanted in humans so here the, the disadvantage is that they have a single electrode per shank so in order for them to increase the area from where they recorded the brain they have to make more and more need and that's it's not just a processing challenge but even a biological challenge because you're now facing trauma and and consequently while this is still an fda approved technology work on this has at least the delta on the progress that's been made on uh, uta arrays has been has been minimal in the past few years this then led way to cmos technologies where people figured that if we have to miniaturize these recording electrodes why not just use the mosfet technology that's available in semiconductors and use the gate of that mosfet to record neural activity and this is promising but again the limiting is that clinically translating this device is tricky it's still made on silicon uh, however for academic purposes this this allows for a higher channel count but it's it's still it's still fairly new and the adoption of this technology is is uh, the jury is still out on on that uh cut the, the next image here is that of an optoprobe uh, an optoprobe is a is another cool technology pioneered by Carl Distroth and Ed Boyden at MIT they figured out that if you if you inject some cells the uh, an animal cell with uh, a virus called channel rhodopsin you can allow optical modulation to record and stimulate from the brain and so researchers then while well, this was a pioneering technology it came very close to winning the nobel prize but and researchers then um, engineers i would say then moved on to making devices which could do not just electrical stimulation but light stimulation as well uh, the image on the bottom left is is that of an ecog and you can see that there's been efforts to to change make different patterns use different substrates and miniaturize the 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 ecog because this is this is also a clinically translated technology and is fairly is quite widely used for epilepsy treatment these two images are those of uh, multimodal probes so this is another uh, cmos probe and then this is one with fluidic connections so this is neuropharmacology is a huge field and if if there is a pharma pharmaceutical treatment that is possible for uh, mental disorders then a device like this would permit for it uh so quite promising and then up until recently i'd like to think that the, the neurotech wars have recently you know so many companies have come up uh my one of my one of the companies that i worked at recently neuralink uh, is, is, uh elon musk led this team and uh, the the whole effort was to miniaturize not just the electrodes but also the packages and uh this this technology the n1 uh, the, the coming at the n1 device pushed for even thinner and even smaller devices that would be implanted in the human brain and the pack for this was so tiny that you could just leave it in the head typically the package is kept outside the head next to the collar bone but with the neuralink device it is so tiny and so compact and allows for wi fast wireless communication that you can just keep it in the skull and and it works perfectly fine so the study is done with pigs and monkeys on this i had the privilege for making they had two demos and i had the privilege for making both the implants that were showcased in the animals and the demos so very very rewarding and creatively satisfying work finally on the bottom right uh, this is again a device that's recently gotten an fda 510k approval uh, called neuropace where they use ecogs for recording and then invasive death probes for stimulation so it's a closed loop feedback system which helps people with parkinsons and epilepsy the image on the bottom here is that of uh, a sensor this is patented by synchron an australian company and, and uh, dr thomas oxley he figured that instead of entering the brain directly why not enter the brain through veins and he figured that if we have a catheter like device with large electrodes on them you can put them in for a very long time without having too invasive of a surgery just as of september 2020 they they reported some preclinical trials very promising and this company is able to raise close to uh, 50 million dollars in in funding for uh, high volume production of of this device the image on the bottom right is is that pioneered by dr charles reber Uh, from howard that's it's that of an, this device is called the neural lace and his his uh, idea was to inject this mesh into into the brain and kind of let it assimilate with the neurons and consequently you would always have some sort of recording activity unfortunately this the work on this has recently stopped uh, but i'm sure one would pick it up if it, if if they show more promise in vivo now 
cut to 2018 and 2019 again I'm, I'm i get very excited when i see these see this research but people wanted to now make smaller devices right you, you don't want to make probes that are wired that are tethered you want to make wireless devices and there were four companies that did this one was neurofixel uh, by by imec in in europe they made these uh, cmos devices again which could be wirelessly recorded from but these are still at the animal trial uh, stage so they still the jury is still out on them uh, this technology on the right neurobrain was pioneered by uh, Uh, Brown University, where they made minute CMOS chips that could be distributed inside the brain, like a network, and they could communicate with each other using Bluetooth and and moved around using ultrasound. Very bold and very innovative technology, and again, I'm very excited to see this. One of the in the at least in the last 25 years, this 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 work has been pioneering. And if they do get good results, I'm sure you know we're not too far away from seeing the age of the Android. Uh, and Im- the image on the bottom left is out of a of a version of neurobrain that was developed by UC Berkeley prior to the neurobrain. It's called the neural dust, and they've then uh, ventured into uh, then commercialized this technology through a company called uh, IOTA. Uh, similar similar idea that you could make tiny grain like chips. and which could distribute themselves across the brain and then communicate with ultrasound and finally very recently the synapse probe from italy has has come up uh, the difference between synapse and neuropixel they both cmos probes so the difference was uh, the synapse recorded more channels uh, at any point of time so neuropixels because of the technology limits them to recording only from 400 channels at a time but with the synapse probe they could record from 4000 so that's an order of magnitude higher uh, and and it's a scalable technology so excellent work again uh, a lot of researchers have flocked to them to try this out but the jury still out them but this is this research is as of you know two years ago uh, so really cutting edge indeed cutting edge and that brings me to what me and uh, what arjun and i have been doing in india so we figured that you know uh, the the us markets are, are fairly saturated now there's, there's a lot of proliferation of these neural devices but asia is is still not uh, there still hasn't been a lot of research done in asia and we figured that you know together we want to do something and together we want to help people in 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 asia starting with india so we've developed uh, intracortical probes made with polyimid but this is a proprietary polyimid that that we've put years into where uh, the chronic lifetime of this polyimid is much longer than what's commercially out there i'm quite excited for it because this gets us closer and closer to clinical translation we use uh, state of the art thin film lens technology in india we've developed it and we can go down to 4 microns in thickness which potentially being one of the thinnest probes out there in the world uh, and this because we have our own polymer it lends itself well to this technology so our, what i'm showing you on the left is an image of how fabricated it's done on a silicon wafer and you can put different designs uh, that that research is customized on it at a time and then release them off the silicon wafer for use Uh, but the cool thing about these devices is these are hundred times thinner than our head. So you imagine how thin and flimsy they are, and how how difficult it would be to to insert them. I'm talking about the thickness uh, of these devices. This part is what goes in, not not the ones with the rectangles, but the the ability to make not just flexible but ultra flexible devices is what got us excited and we, we developed this technology at uh, Ava Neuro so just recently we've we've tested them for cytotoxicity and done some animal uh, experiments with them i'd be happy to share them uh, more towards the end of the presentation now you know i keep talking about these electrodes and i keep talking about different companies and their designs but really there is no one answer you know there isn't a solution for the at least when we're studying the brain a lot of the neurons are different they they the the regions of the brain that you want to target are different so there isn't the one solution for it fits all strategy that can be adopted here and that's why with thin film lens technology you can now change the length the width the dimensions of the probes you can change how the probe looks uh, you can base it for you know how you want to surgically uh, insert it depending on the research i mean there could be innovative ways to do surgery to reduce uh, biological damage so this thin film technology essentially allows us to to make customized designs which is which is really rule 101 of this game that if you're able to customize your design you you know, you're off to the right you're off to the right start so what we at ava believe is if you can draw it we can make it 
Uh, it is also near an excess, uh, another company in, the, in Michigan, they, they, they do this too. But this technology is, is so ubiquitous and, and uh, exciting that it lends itself very well to, to, for researchers to study the human brain. Uh, and I know, I know I'm, I'm showing you images, but it's very hard to understand the depth or, or the thickness of these probes, how it translates to the brain. And the image on the left is, is uh, I've got that from uh, the Blink N1 video uh, that, that was implanted in, in uh, Page of the Monkey. And you can see that the devices are tiny enough to, to avoid the blood vessels in the brain, let alone ha harm or, or uh, hurt, the, hurt the brain. So with this, you, with such a thin accessible technology, you can now put a lot of tiny arrays without causing biological, without causing trauma to the animal or human. And this is exciting work. And it just puts into perspective how, how, how thin these devices are and how difficult they are to insert. A lot of neurosurgeons have come up with great ways to, to insert them uh, and reduce biological damage. And that's kind of pushed how, how we can study and the amount of data we can gather from neuronal recordings. Uh, this image on the right is that of a recent experiment just as of last week that our probe uh, was did in, in a hawk moth. So hawk moth, really tiny animal, and our probes were able to be put inside the neck muscles of the hot moth and record uh, some EMGs from them. Another cool thing that I want to highlight with, with flexible materials as opposed to silicon is uh, also correction, silicon and not silicone, not, don't confuse that. Uh, so we've, this image on the bottom right is an explanted probe. And you can see that there's no damage to the probe, there's no damage to the animal, and this probe will be implanted and explanted as many number of times. So in, in an actual realization in a clinical setting, if, if something does go wrong during the surgery, the stroke can be explanted easily without hurting or damaging the brain. So you know, things like getting upgrades maybe for software or for hardware are really possible because uh, this, this process is, you know, you could do it over and over. Now, just to, you know, this, this conversation, this talk, today's talk was more about introducing IBMIs and how we use thin film MEMS technology to manufacture these. So I'm just going to take you through the process of how uh, generally these devices, these devices are manufactured and how at A1 Euro we, we do them. So initially, there are, our, our surgical and neuroscience team sits with uh, the, the customers, the researchers, to understand their animal model and then figure out a way for them to insert these devices and record good signals. So things like electrode area, the width of the probe, the length of the probe, how flexible they wanted are, are topics of conversation. And once we figured out uh, a good design, we translate it to a CAD model. So this is then made on a, on a CAD software and then put onto something called as a photo mask with end use to, it's, it's something like photography where, where you're uh, exposing this layer onto a silicon wafer and then slowly stacking thin film layers on the top. This design then gets put on a mask and you can see that, uh, the image on the bottom right is, is, shows you a photo mask. It's a quartz plate on one side and a chrome plate on the other. And then there are openings on the chrome plate which align to the designs that you've made. Uh, and then we perform photolithography on it for manufacturing. So to take you through the manufacturing process, initially we used we start with regular silicon wafers, we clean them, we descum them. And then we spin uh, a layer of our uh, spin code, a layer of our polyimid. It's proprietary, and there's a, there's a way we do it. Uh, it's, it's different from what's traditionally done out there. And then we do lithography. So with lithography, we're able to, if you see the image uh, on the left, uh, this is how we, we do patterning. So when we draw out the CAD model, we then utilize uh, we spin code uh, a photosensitive polymer on a wafer and then expose it through through that uh, through a mask. So with this, uh, you're able to put uh, designs and then have thin film designs be stacked onto the wafer. This is an example of liftoff where uh, you could put down metal and put down thin film traces, uh, which which can be which are used for traces and recording electrical data. The next step is then to spin code a second layer of polyimide, which acts as a second layer of insulation on the top. 
And then we use oxygen plasma etching to open electrodes. So the electrodes are essentially open on, on the top part of the polymer. And then the outline is, is etched off to, to make, to singulate the devices. So on the bottom right, you see the devices on the wafers being singulated. And then on, on the top, bottom left, sorry. And on the top right, you can see the electrodes. So these are platinum electrodes with thin film, uh, Thai platinum gold traces uh, that, that so you're not able, not just able to utilize and harness uh, the, the benefits of using precious metals, but with this, you're also able to uh, drop the cost significantly because you're not using a lot of metal. Finally, these devices are then released off the silicon wafer in, in uh, IPA or in Microsoft, and then they're assembled onto PCBs to, to uh, connect to uh, amplifiers and recording stations. Uh, so just to explain, I, I know I just teased the concept of lithography a little bit, and I want to go into it uh, just in a little more detail to explain how it works. So the idea is, is similar to photography, where you have a photosensitive layer, which you expose using, using a, 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 a reticle, and then the exposed region on the resist is then developed, so it's, it's dissolved away, and that makes openings. So when you have that, you're able to either put down deposit uh, material, or you're able to etch material off. Uh, so an image, and there are different ways to do it. There's UV lithography, there's deep UV lithography. Recently, there's what Intel uses is extreme UV lithography, which goes down to 10 nanometers and smaller. But we use contact lithography, which allows the electrodes to, which allows the critical dimensions to go down to one uh, micron. So the images here show you what a photo mask is. And then a, this is called the mask liner, contact mask liner, which allows you to align features on the wafer to the next layer. And then with the UV source, you're, you expose it. Uh, just an image of how the, the wafer and the reticle uh, align. And then finally, the photoresist layer gets developed to make features on it. So eventually, you're finished with uh, either putting down metal or taking away metal, you can then dissolve this uh, photoresist, photosensitive layer away, and then just have the metal or the edge portions remaining. Now, uh, two, two ways you can proceed after doing lithography. You can either put down metal with deposition. They can be either physical vapor deposition or chemical vapor deposition. What we use is e beam lithography. And uh, I'm just going to tease it a little bit. But it's a system where the machine is in, in, is in high, vac high vacuum. It goes down to 10 raised to negative 6 torr. Uh, at this stage, you have uh, an electron beam that gets shown onto a metal crucible. Is, is this the crucible? a tungsten crucible with metal pellets in it. And the e-beam, the heat from the e-beam is able to not just uh, melt the metal pellets, but also evaporate it. This evaporated metal then goes and then evaporates and condenses onto a waste. And that's how we pattern uh, metal traces down. Uh, so we do this with titanium, gold, and platinum. And then eventually, once the deposition is done, we strip off the resist. Uh, with, and just have the metal remaining in the areas where we want it to be. Uh, another technique, and I, you know, again, this is this is a cool technique. We're using etching to do so. Now, the challenge with etching polyamid is polyamid and photoresist etch at the same rate in oxygen plasma. So, if if you have let's say ten microns of polyamide, you need ten microns or more of photoresist. Otherwise, it's just going to etch through the photoresist and etch into the polyamide. So, what we do is we're using some, something called as a hard mask, where we use put down another sacrificial layer, uh, aluminum in this case, and then pattern the aluminum to make openings. So, instead of having a photosensitive mask, you now have a metal mask, and then we proceed with the oxygen plasma etching. Beautiful color, right? Like it's a it's a nice purple color that you see in the oxygen plasma, and this over time etch the polyamide to form volatile compounds, which get then get sucked in, uh, neutralized, and then released. Uh, so very cool technology. It's fairly recent, just made in, in the last 20 years. NASA was the one to pioneer it. And then it moved, this was a polymer then became, uh, then became a popular choice to use in organic flexible uh, electronics and also in high temperature electronics. Now talking a little bit about invasive BMIs and how they work. So, so far, the, the lowest hanging fruit or the easiest way to translate a BMI is to put it in a motor cortex. The motor cortex, primary motor cortex in the brain, is an area in the brain that sends signals to move, to control your limbs, to control motor actions. Now, when people, oftentimes people with these diseases, uh, with uh, dis mental degenerative disorders, have spinal cord issues. Either they've been in, a, in an accident or they've been born with a defect. And, but the fortunate thing is that 
because the spinal if, if if this parts of the spinal cord are not working that doesn't mean the brain is not working so if we put into the signals that are created in the brain we can then meander around the spinal cord and just use that to actuate something else like an exoskeleton or or even an arm a prosthetic arm that's that's connected to your body uh, so if you know the whole point of doing an invasive bmi is to leverage those signals and those signals down to a single neuron so you get very high spatial resolution now someone you know i posted this on linkedin the other day and someone commented saying this is this is rubbish like why why would we put something in our brain it's dangerous we could do this with an eeg very true you could do it this with an eeg but the 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 co correctness of that eeg would would drop significantly and it's when i say significantly is orders of magnitude different because well eeg works great for certain applications doing uh, motor control like this is is very difficult with with eeg uh, especially with so many degrees of freedom and that's why i my is there to stay they're not going out of uh, business uh, so the way the basic components of a bmi are the electrode uh, which which records electrical activity from the brain and then that data goes to a decoder where it gets filtered it gets amplified and then it gets sorted so something called spike sorting which means you collect activity electrical activity from uh, the neurons and then you time you band pass filter it for certain frequencies of interest and then you time map it so that you figure out what the cause and effect relationship of an action is now with that there is an output device it could be an actuator it could be an exoskeleton it could just be a tv screen uh, which which allows you to use your those signals in the brain to perform actions and then there is feedback back to the person so whenever they see just what the fets paper predicted where the monkey is able to control the firing rate of the neurons with with if a person with spinal cord injury is able to see a computer monitor and uses brain signals to control the cursor he can then use his own biology to to uh, control it better to get better at this technology and that's why it's it's while this is difficult to do with animals because it's hard to communicate the feedback to animals we researchers and, and scientists do expect that this would be much easier to do in humans if if uh, this gets uh, proven to be safe and uh, a safe technology for us now on the bottom right again an image from brown where two people use this to control uh, cursor for texting and then this language texting was then used uh, to 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 communicate through whatsapp so way cool technology uh, professor ramakrishnan is on this call and my co-founder he works a lot with the decision making part of the brain and he does he uses the he develops decoding algorithms to to study those uh, so to, you know, again to talk about decode is a little the three components way basic uh, i'm sure there's more to it i'm not an expert on it but from my understanding i'd love to tell you something uh, so the signals that come through they're essentially they initially filtered and amplified to to be able to detect certain shapes now threshold filtering is a fairly common technique where they just look at the amplitude of the spikes recorded and if that amplitude goes beyond a certain threshold you detect that as as an as an activity and then this activity is then discretized where you have individual components of discrete data and they get clubbed together to detect certain cause and effect relationships uh, very so it, This, this processing of course it sounds trivial when i say it but it's a lot more complicated to do it in person and there has to be a lot of training and machine learning that also goes on to to figure out uh, the actions of the brain because each day the brain uh, there are about 85 trillion synapses that happen in the human brain and to figure those out it's, it's difficult to do this with a with a trivial algorithm uh and now this is this is the exciting one this is the second part of the uh, of the call uh i'm just going to maybe ask uh, karthik if if uh, people are tired or they they like a break and maybe we could take a break for 2 minutes just get some respite and then i'll finish off with the rest of the slides i think if if so we can just uh, audience can just put it in the chat if you need a break or so yeah oh. Also, by the way, like, uh, was the time for the second session? Is it going to be like fifteen minutes? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds minutes. good. So, so okay, we could, we could we just begin. People are enjoying. So oh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Very kind of you. All right. Awesome. So we researchers realized that. Uh, pardon me. I'm just going to get a sip of water. Great. 
So researchers realize that we're not stopping there, right? We're not just stopping with decoding. We have to go beyond. We, we're not just making a diagnostic device, but to make a therapeutic device. So we figured a lot of research came out of uh, UT Dallas. This this Bitan Chakravarti was on this call. He's he's he worked with uh, Dr. Kogan, who was who's who wrote a pioneering paper on cortical stimulation. But there are materials uh, that use either capacity of Faraday charge transfer to inject current into the brain. Now what happens is a brain is just like an electrical electrical circuit, right? Now you've got a, 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 a a stream of charge passing through the brain and then into the muscle. Now, imagine if you're able to, let's say you've got a seizure where the brain is passing too much current, right? And that's why your arm moves or your, your body moves and you get a fit. But uh, if you want to stop that, there, are, there is a potential for using external charge with these devices, which gets injected into the brain and inhibits any charge transfer to go through. Now, there are two mechanisms by which this can happen, either inhibition or excitation. So in areas where you want certain actions to happen, like let's say someone's it's someone's having difficulty moving their arm, then you could use cortical stimulation to inject charge into the brain and then cause a lot of movement. Uh, and the, the other side to it is you could inject charge in, in certain other areas to inhibit uh, charge firing. And this technology is not possible. Again, like that comes with an asterisk because the jury's still out there, but this is not possible with, with uh, surface stimulation or EEGs or, or uh, you know, other non-invasive technologies because you're just missing out on that kind of spatial and temporal resolution. You know, the brain fires in, in, in like milliseconds, so it's difficult to, to stimulate something with, with that high of a frequency and that high of a charge non-invasively. And that's, you know, my work continues to be in this field. Now, uh, these were electrodes on the bottom left that, that I designed in 2018. They use the novel uh, high-K dielectric material for capacitor stimulation. Um, and this material, uh, again, with stimulation, you could also do, uh, similar to stimulation, you could also do voltammetry. So in synapses, where there are neurotransmitters used for chemical, you know, the neurotransmitters are chemicals in the brain that essentially allow uh, charge to transfer, information to transfer between two neurons, the, the axon terminal and the axon. So uh, you can use cyclic voltammetry to detect those chemicals as well. So a lot of, when you hear this research and scientists figure out that serotonin helps with sleeping or, or norepinephrine, norepinephrine works with reducing heart attacks. I'm making this up, don't, don't quote me on this, but they were able to figure this out because they use these probes with cyclic voltammetry to, to detect and neurotransmitters. And you can also code these probes with certain proteins, which again, like this is beyond the scope of today, but I'm, I'm excited, so I'm sharing this with you, but there's a male to female part essentially of these proteins. And when you detect those neurochemical neurotransmitters, you're able to understand their, their role better. So cortical stimulation goes to the end game. I think uh, that's where, that's where uh, people will really get help. And that's where the, the community and the market will see money because people would buy this. If, if you know, God forbid, but years down the line, if I get Parkinson's, I think I want something like this because uh, uh, you know, there's a technology called deep brain stimulation where it's, they're large electrodes and they're not too uh, targeted, but when you put those in the brain and then when you inject a lot of charge, you're able to reduce uh, tremors. And uh, this helps with people who suffer from SR tremors. So it's a wonderful technology. It's not completely understood as of 2021. There's a lot of research going on in it, but there is a high potential for something like this to, to happen. And you know, uh, oftentimes, I don't know if it's coincidental or not, but uh, science always follows fiction. And in the movie Avatar uh, or Avatar, if, you, if you're from India, you, you, I don't know if you remember, but the, the avatars are able to communicate with their land, with their tree, uh, using using uh, certain uh, you know, images, right? And it helps them heal, it helps them work. And really, it, 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 I, it won't be too uh, difficult. Or maybe maybe it's a little audacious, but it is, a, it is a possibility. It is a possibility with humans. And this technology is, is ubiquitous, so it can help with a lot of diseases, uh, not just the ones we know of. Right. So uh, today, you know, where does the competitive landscape start, and what are the the streams of thought? Right. So there are five different 
uh, streams of thought and what researchers are pursuing. So the first one, very uh, primitive ones, uh, the silicon arrays, these are still very common, uh, highly used in, in research because of uh, because traditionally they've worked well and the infrastructure surrounding those probes uh, do exist. You then have, these are uh, multi, multiple electrodes on single shanks, shank meaning a certain one particular needle, and they they have a smaller footprint per electrode. Uh, the Utah NOS, again, these, these are chronic devices. Oh, the silicon arrays suffer from chronic use. So it's difficult for, for us to use them in chronic settings because, because they fail in a few months. Uh, the Utah NOS work really well. They have, they lend themselves well for chronic use, but they're limited by the resolution that, uh, that uh, by the scalability that they can achieve. CMOS probes, again, a new alternative, but clean translation is difficult because they're still made on silicon. Uh, and then the silicone arrays, which are, which, which is again pioneered in Germany, uh, they made from uh, silicone. Silicone is, is the food grade material that you use for your, your food boxes or ice trays, your cake molds. And th that's, a, that's, that's a very inert material as well, but processing with it is, is difficult and you can't spin thin films of it. So scaling it down further is, is challenging. And that's why, you know, at Ava Neuro, Arjun and I developed uh, our own ultra flexible polyamide arrays because uh, the book doesn't stop at 10 microns. It has to go thinner. It has to be smaller. And, and the belief is that the smaller you go, the less the brain identifies this as a potential for an object or potential for an arm, and the less response or biological response it sees, uh, allowing it to be used for chronic settings. So very versatile technology, and this is scalable. So right now, with what we have, we're able to scale this down to four microns. And just you know, from the mission on the slides, you can tell that that's that's an order of magnitude difference, right, from what's what's out there. We're close to the silicon arrays, but you know that that mo movement from 15 microns and 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 below, that's different. And we've got that with our technology. Uh, this is a stupid picture because the one ruby coin keeps changing. I just had it in my in my uh, stock photos, but uh, you can probably relate the the size of these probes to to you know uh, or how tiny they are. But if I were to tell you that they're, they're less than hundred microns, so extremely thin, extremely tiny, and with multiple channels, multiple electrodes on them. Uh, the competitive landscape it's filling up quickly. There's a lot of work being done in the U.S. Almost ninety four percent of the world's neuroscience work is being done in the U.S. Uh, a lot of it is done being done in Europe now, but Asia is a growing market. Asia and Africa are a growing market, and both Arjun and I are proud to announce that we're the first neurotech company in Asia, in uh, South Asia. Uh, there are a few other companies who are working on it, but they still have, don't have a product yet. Uh, so we're, we're proud to hit the market, uh, at least in India, first, and then help root for help make a make a difference in in uh, in this field in in India, uh, and. You know, so far, like because the US has been a big market there, it's been difficult for Indian researchers to import these devices or use these in hospitals. Uh, and from the preliminary work that we've done, we've heard we've got some great testimonials that our devices would allow for an easier integration of uh, the electronics industry, the medical manufacturing industry with hospitals and researchers. And it also brings this down. Uh, India is, uh, again, this massive amount of data and uh, so much research that's happening that to, together, like if we collect a biobank, I don't think possibly decoding the brain would be too far out. Maybe maybe a decade, decade and a half, but it's it's a realistic uh, it's a realistic uh, uh, prospect, and we're excited for this. So you know, promising results. And then uh, finally, uh, I want to uh, you know you, you guys know me already, but I also wanted to introduce Arjun, who's part of Ava. He's a professor of, at the Bioengineering Insti uh, Department at IIT Kanpur, and he's also working on some EEG and invasive uh, startups. He worked with at UPenn and Duke before. Uh, in fact, he's, he's worked with uh, some of the early founding members at Neuralink. Uh, so we had a lot in common then. Uh, and finally, this brings me to the end of my presentation. I just want to end with, with a high remark saying, uh, the work's been done in, in neural probes, the silicon neural probes or Utah probes, they were, they were, they made an impact, they made a change. And then in at least the last couple, five, five years or so, the CMOS arrays have, have made a difference. But now with uh, us, with, with Ava Neuro and then all the participants uh, on this call, I think we're the next wave, we're the follow-up wave. 
and we want to hit being be there at the right place uh, at the right time in the right capacity and uh, with that i welcome you all to the second machine age let's let's get into the age of the android uh, and you know let's 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 uh, let's bring out about the next evolution thank you thank you so much for your time uh, the floor is so open for the questions now yeah thank you so much guys so yeah maybe we'll, we'll open the questions and uh... If the audience has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. I think there's already a question by Vai Dehi. Do you want to unmute yourself? I think. Uh, Kausa, are you able to see the question? Uh, I'll read the question. Yeah. You. Can polyamide um, probes be used as a potential tool for therapeutic targeted drug delivery of peptides or SIRNAs, which are primarily hydrophilic? and cannot yeah. cross the blood brain barrier with conventional delivery yes. systems yes they can there's been a lot of research done at university of pittsburgh uh, there's there's research of cc who has coated these probes with serotonin and other uh, proteins and hydrogels which can allow and with with microfluidic capabilities they're allowed to inject pharmaceuticals inside the brain and then treat them not just electrically but uh, chemically as well so definitely this this technology lends itself to to that possibility great okay i think bitten has another question i think he has yeah. already sent the question so yeah. his question is to implant these devices neuralink uses a robot to perform the surgery yeah. the precision is therefore very high and can easily penetrate yeah. the pr pr mat of the brain so what's your strategy okay. that's a good question right so uh, the the robot that neuralink uses it's picked up by a needle syringe which is which is thin which is uh, 40 to 50 microns uh, wide so we use we use a similar strategy we either stiffen these probes with a temporary stiffener uh, that allows them to be strong while inserting but they water soluble so the moment they hit the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain it dissolves uh, and the other strategy is that we use is to uh, put is to thread a, a micro needle through a loop in these devices and then put them in and then put the the micro needle out leaving the probes in okay uh audience if you have any questions kindly unmute yourself and ask us you can ask the question yourself uh, hello kustub when uh, i it was a very nice talk uh, thank you thank i just you. wanted to know uh, yeah Uh, uh how much uh, means uh, you have conducted this on a uh, uh, mice or uh, what animals uh, you have used this probe we we do we do a lot of animals small animals uh, large animals so uh, my co-founder arjun he works with monkeys so these probes can be used in monkeys the only difference is the designs are different but we've done them on rodents and hawk moths moths is really really tiny uh, they're, they're the size of uh, Uh, it's somewhat larger than a fruit fly and then smaller than a grasshopper or a fly maybe yeah. okay and uh, like in monkeys uh, how much uh, time duration you have kept it like maximum time duration what we have used for like how was the means how was the degradation of oh. signal over the period of time that's a good question that's a good question i i'd probably get into it in just a little detail maybe i'll take a minute to explain but the moment you put the brain, the probe in it incites something called as uh, inflammation so it of course it causes inflammation because of uh, in general it incites incite something called as the the chronic body response so the initial response just like when you when you prick your finger with uh, with with a sharp object uh, initially there's this blood flow and there's injury so there's inflammation the area around it goes right? I, i am a doctor then, uh, just to know oh i see uh, okay okay i'm a so, neurosurgeon so, i'm, I'm Yeah. nice nice i'm not so in in terms of uh, you know for you so we get glial gliosis essentially so you get a glial response which uh, for for people who are not from the medical field glial cells are essentially an umbrella term used for uh, cells that do certain functions in the brain so what happens when there's an injury is that these cells come and wrap the probe wrap around the probe it is believed that it's like say a bacteria that goes in the body is way to fight it is to wrap wrap these around with uh, with these glial cells and suffocate it to death suffocate in terms of both like food and and uh, and and other but uh, the same process happens to neural probes in but because these cells are quite thin Uh, you can still record so initially when you put probes in uh, and this is a good indication of the recording performance so the impedance 
goes high initially. And then once the gliosis settles down, once the body thinks that the glial cells have coated these probes uniformly, then the impedance plateaus. And that's at that stage where you start getting your know, chronic recordings. So the probes by themselves uh, operate, you get useful data for uh, quite a long time. Uh, with these, the, the best research that's happened on these polymer probes uh, in a case where they lasted for two years, and then the researchers stopped that experiment because statistically a lot of theories fail. But when you, this, it's a combination, it's a permutation and combination scheme. Because if you have a wider electrode area or a bigger device, then it lasts longer. But that's not that's not the purpose. We need to go smaller and thinner and more electrodes so that we don't cause a lot of gliosis. And uh, at the same we keep we ensure that the recording performance is good too. So the uh, to, for Bhushan, you the moment these probes go in, it, it incites gliosis, and then until that gliosis becomes un, unsophisticated, that it's around the 14-day mark, that's when we start uh, settling down and getting uh, the chronic performance. Okay. And uh, uh, just means out of the very question, how much uh, time you are expecting it uh, to start your human trials? Oh, oh man, I wish I could do it tomorrow, right? <laughs> I wish I could do it on me. I, I trust my technology. Uh, so I don't know. I think like there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy in like, not in the bad sense, in a good sense, because like you don't want to kill someone, right? Uh, just like with the COVID vaccine, uh, even even after going through speedy trials, it took them almost a year to come up with, uh, you know, to get approvals. So something like this, you know, unless they're stable for a year, two years, and they don't see long-term damage, uh, it's 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 challenging. But uh, a lot of companies have applied for an FDA 510K, which is a pre-market trial. So pre-market trials work with all cohorts of of patients, and then you you study them. So there is potential for translation. Uh, it's just a it's just a matter of like funding. It's a matter of you know getting patients to willingly accept this. It's also you know the, the ethical concerns that come with this too. So yeah, you know, all, all the researchers across the world are slowly like figuring that phase out. But yeah. uh, you know we're hoping Neuralink leads the way. But, and then no, but I guess way. if you want to uh, apply in India now that. Uh, uh, you have to apply for DCGI directly, correct? Apply for, sorry, DC? DCGI, uh, the Indian FDA. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's so true. If you're planning to do it in yeah. India, like really, yeah. I want to be a part of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, if we'd you love to. I mean, feel free to shoot us an email and then I'm sure we can, we can talk. Always excited to collaborate with people. More the merrier. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, hey, Thanks uh, Bhushan. Hi, uh, Kosto Banerjun. This is Bupend, and thank you. Thank you very much for this. Was a fantastic presentation, and in fact, you, fantastic Bupen. work you guys have done so far. I'm wondering. I mean, if you don't mind, would you like yeah. to share some price range what you have within uh, for these props you have developed? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, it it really depends. Uh, if I go back to my presentation, right? Oops. Oh, mm -hmm. There we go. So we manufacture these on, on silicon wafers, right? And then for us, we price the real estate of the silicon wafer. Where someone wants a massive probe, then you know they pay more. And someone wants a smaller probe like this, they pay less. So it's really the price of, of uh, the, the real, silicon real estate and not the probe by itself. Uh, but ordinarily, I would probably think of it as uh, in tens of thousands. So not more than a lakh and not less than maybe like 15,000. So that is INR, right? I know, yeah, yeah. Oh boy, like not dollars. Who, who's gonna pay like hundred thousand dollars? So, by the way, uh, what is the data? What is the data collection process? I mean, is there yeah. something you're giving some interface? To, uh, how? Uh, so, your part is just actually helping us to give this kind of probes develops, right? And then you're giving some sort of interface for data collection. Yes. And uh, then after it's it's a responsibility of whosoever researcher is doing some sort of data analysis on top of that, or you have some sort of interface created which is a, even uh, evaluating data collected out of that. So uh, I, I think if Arjun's still on the call, uh, maybe he can answer that because uh, he it's his dream really. That's a very good question, Vivendra. It's his dream to start a biobank. For, for this kind of data. We don't make the software for it, but everyone's got their own algorithms. There's 
it, it, it's, it's not like a one solution fits all model. So uh, That's good. people have been trying this, but uh, Arjun, if you're on the call, uh, maybe, maybe if you'd like to take that. I think uh, Professor Arjun has left right now. I'm not sure if he's on oh, call. Okay. Um, Never mind. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Right. right. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we don't make them as yet. We don't make the software as yet. But there are certain com companies like Intan and Neuron Access who make these commercial packages. So there aren't a lot of them. And most resources to use theirs. But uh, the whole point is to. It, it's not just about recording, but it's about decoding. So when they figure out the cause and effect relationship, that's what's important. So the human connectome project, right, that the world has announced. Uh, there is there are uh, some uh, open source uh, websites on there. Open source uh, resources on there which allow you to communicate and share this data. But we don't do it as of now. Arjun does it in his in his lab, but not we don't do it commercially. I have fact I have in, uh, started some initiative around that. I'm from even uh, research background, so I'm doing some sort of even analysis on the uh, algorithmic side. So. Yeah. I think I'll connect you offline. So let's see how we can actually utilize to this uh, uh, props in our further research perspective. And, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, so please uh, feel free uh, to drop an email and, or, or message me. Yeah, and then, yeah, uh, can, I just you send you a LinkedIn me. connection, so we'll connect you offline. Yeah. So, sounds good, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I think that's great. So uh, the data, so data, in fact, I mean, once you implant these props into the brain, right? So then what kind of data is actually generating? What kind of information you are providing? Decoding is oh, something so, I understood. Yeah. yeah, so we can record right down to single units. So like information, record action potentials from a single neuron. Uh, and it, some people prefer to record LFPs. Some prefer other other like uh, more uh, superimposed signals, but we can go down to a neuronal level. So we can pick up the dimensions of our electrodes are 15 microns or less, uh, and with, with those we can this definitely allows for uh, neuronal recordings. Uh, ideally, typically, I think rule of thumb is uh, the separation between neurons is about 80 microns. Eight, so having a 15 micron electrode placed between them is, is quite, uh, comes in quite handy to record that information. You have some sample data collected out of that? Um, I do, I don't think I have it on the presentation though, because uh, it's like ethical, you know, legal thing, yeah, right? yeah. someone else's data. <laughs> so I'd, I'd be happy to share it uh, offline. Yeah, let, let's, let's connect offline. I think this is fantastic so, and we really proud at least uh, you started from India, uh, Thank you. and uh, and definitely this is something Southeast Asia. I mean, I'm basically uh, working in the similar area. Uh, maybe I'll share uh, more offline. So I'm as of now based out Malaysia, uh, but yeah, yeah. So but yeah, basically from India itself. So okay. I think yeah, there are lots of potential in uh, Southeast Asia market. So in fact not Southeast Asia and entire Asia market, I would say compared to US and Europe, and they are quite ahead uh, with our Asia market. So there are definitely a huge potential. And most Thank important you. is something we are, uh, I mean, you guys are doing for a community. It is definitely trying to solve some uh, impo very, very critical problem, which is actually uh, giving back to community. That's true. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Bhupendra. And thanks for Hi, Kenny. Uh, hey, Vidhan. How are you? Good, good. So I had a, like a comment uh, on uh, what you're discussing just right now. So yeah. I think uh, not only um, for the side of recording, but also for the side of stimulation, there is a huge open market for, you know, uh, providing steam engines, if you can say, yes. you know, yeah. and, and, and um, I just wanted to like, um, add on to uh, what the other person was actually talking about uh, and probably, um, you know, investing in steam engines. And if you're looking at, you know, stimulation and therape therapeutical stimulation, for example, that opens up another market altogether. So, uh, I mean, is, is there a plan to develop that? And, and if you could remember, you know, even in Neuralink, we were, you know, trying our best to come up with a solution, right? Okay. So, you know, uh, so that's basically uh, think, a comment and a question together. 
I, I agree. I think uh, the difference between Neuralink and Eva Nero is uh, we, we, we're not as big of, of a company. So for us, uh, we, we plan on using uh, OEMs. And then there, there are other companies out there who, who make uh, stem engines and packages. Uh, so it, the, the, the whole idea is to, to be modular. So if you make a device that can interface with uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, packages, medical packages, then that's the goal. I think Neuralink had its own monolithic package. So for them, it was, it was, a, it was a different challenge interfacing all the components in-house. But uh, if, at least for me, the, the, the plan is to, to connect to other companies uh, like Integer or New Vectra and then use their engines. But it's, it's still a little far out, I would say. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Vidhan. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Kenny, for the wonderful presentation. No problem. Thanks. Thank you, Bidhan. Uh, any other questions? I think... Yeah, I wanted to say something. So yeah, super amazing talk. And uh, so I'm Shrutika. I'm from Arjun's lab. I'm part from. I'm yes, part yeah. of the decision making lab. Yeah. So um, the discussion was super amazing. I will convey this to Arjun as well. I think you would also. But uh, yeah, I had the same. I'm an undergraduate student and. Uh, the kind of, I mean, no, this was my first talk in this domain, particularly because we study mm -hmm. mostly decision making and most, right. mostly on the academic side of it. So the technological right. side. So I wanted to just say that it was really nice. Uh, it was on a level that even I could understand, I felt. And um, another question, I think it was covered some, somewhat. But when right. we talk about invasive, how invasive right. it is, I mean, on the aspects of... Right pain basically pain to the model yeah. organism uh, yeah. how would you in what range of pain are we saying uh, you talked no, about that's, that's, and everything that's a but, very good question so for humans uh, this is amazing right uh, but just we feel pain in the rest of our body but pain is communicated to the brain through pain receptors called prostaglandins the brain doesn't have that so you could poke someone in the brain with a knife and they would not feel anything because the brain doesn't have any pain receptors so for whoever is undergoing the surgery, it's all there's no anesthesia. It's it's an uh, you know uh, it's an awake patient surgery, uh, and then you know based on that's why like if you if you watch some neurosurgeries, they, the patient's always awake and there's feedback. There's someone in the front, you know, someone pokes in the brain and say, "Is this the region we're into?" And then the person moves in there or, or something. So there is no pain because the brain doesn't have any any pain receptors. Wow, it I doesn't I, really implant yeah. too many of them because you, yeah. you, you'd cause a lot of damage in the brain without really feeling anything. But uh, yeah, patient doesn't feel anything. And for yeah, other the... animals, there's always anesthesia that's administered. And it's it's you know when you look at the scale, right? Like it, they, these are really tiny compared to our, our, our brains. True. So it's it's uh, it's yeah, even like these are the blood vessels, right? For you know, yeah. so they're tinier than the blood width of the blood vessels. So it's unlikely that. Uh, it's going to do a lot of damage. And you can see that the explanted probe also is like neat and clean. And it, you know, you're not pulling out like part of the brain. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's fairly smooth and uh, it's a good process. Yeah. So that's very exciting to know because we are talking about invasive, invasive, but it's actually yeah. not that invasive that I, now that you yeah. uh, talk about it. So yeah, really yeah, exciting. Yeah. I did not know about this aspect at all. So yeah, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm I'm glad. I'm glad the, the the talk. Thanks for joining in on a Saturday. Thank you. Evening. Thank you. So, uh, any other questions from the audience? I think all of you are excited. Right. If there are no uh, other questions, then we can just conclude the talk. Because already I and Kausuk have had enough discussions on technical. So I think my query yeah. was somewhat yeah. okay, completed. So my only final question is, yes. I mean, not a question, but I just wanted to know where is Eva Neuro right now? What are the, what are the next three plans that you have? And oh, we're, we're, still, we're still young then. We've, we've made prototypes and we've uh, you know, made some money by selling to research labs. Eventual goal is to, to chart the road for clinical translation. So we're, you know, because technology is not very different, right? Like again, I, I don't mean I don't mean to say this. Uh, I don't mean to be very like cocky saying this or egotistical saying this. But the technology in India or like Malaysia or, or the US, it's similar because it's the tools that are used to make these things. It's, it's, they're not humans, or they're not. It's 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 not too far. It's not too different. So what Neuralink is 
making word neural networks the the same technology is available in a lot of places like any place that makes semiconductors this technology is readily available and i'm not even using technology that's recent in semiconductors this this one micron was this was made in the 1980s right uh, for when when uh, the same technology that uh, the the pentium processor used so pentium i don't know if it, most people on this call are even as old to remember the pentium processor but uh, it's it's an old technology so the the tools but you know the utilization to make not just electrical but mechanical structures is what makes it now uh, so the 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 whole premise is that you know we for eva at least we we want to take it slow we want to make this technology uh, readily available that's the first mm -hmm. milestone but after that at least we expect in q3 or q4 of 2022 where we've applied to a couple of uh, academic grants and if, and if we get them we want to chart the road to example where we develop uh, not not you know these designs but like one design that might have clinical translation and then continue on with uh, animal studies so the animal studies itself go on themselves go on for a couple of years and uh, if the data these are called glt good lab practice studies so if they collected and once we get the regulatory approvals from iso and uh, fda uh, it's only then that we qualify for human trials so it's a long journey but we're still young so i i don't i don't mind <laughs> if, I, hopefully by the time i get parkinson's i want this you know available because uh, you know i don't want to drop my glass <laughs> because of the, the disease but uh, you know it's you got to push right like you know, after the work that people did in, in the 20th century was available to us our work we do is available to the generations after so that's yeah. the goal but the dream is to have a clinical device yeah, and that's where we start great i mean i'm able to like feel the enthusiasm and excitement that you have and all of us share right like and as one of the people in the audience said it's very proud for all of us that our indian startup is like making very uh, High, ad, highly advanced neural probes and is competing with okay. companies like Neuralink. That's a very proud moment for us and for the whole ecosystem. First of all, I need to thank you and Arjun for that. Thank you so much and hope we all are there to support you because currently I've been recently pitching with neurologists and neurosurgeons about the community. Yeah. I mean, even this yeah. afternoon I had pitched the community yeah. to Nimhan's neurologists. So uh, yeah. we are always there to support you in any case if you want to do any like connections with Indian neurologists and neurosurgeons. Yeah. Right, we're always yeah. there, and it's it's a proud moment for all of us, and it's our responsibility to do that for the startup. Uh, so, yeah, please feel free to reach out to the community, and I've also shared the community uh, links. If somebody's like any of you is interested in join NeurotechX India, like you can mail to India NeurotechX.com and also follow our social updates. And finally, yeah, I'm, I'm I was very very excited. This is like the second time I'm hearing all the technical information. I'm still excited, and yeah, like thank you so much, Kaustub, again. And all of us in the community, we feel the same sense of passion. And I think when he was explaining about the brain and getting into the brain with the probes, it was like complete magic. And we feel that we are the new generation magicians who are dealing with the brain and we fall in love with the brain, right? Like that's like super exciting. And hopefully, yeah, this community gets together. All of us gets together, hug the brains uh, and just engineer with it and do something really impactful for the whole world. Yeah. Thanks, Karthik. Thanks for the kind words. And I just want to add, to that is as humans right like we figured out what this one does we figured out what you know the the legs do or what the arms do the brain still evades us you know we're in the 21st century we mapped every tiny corner of the earth but we still don't know what the brains what what our brains do before you know we know a little bit like we know what certain areas of the brain do but you know we can't treat them and I feel like it, it, as evolution progresses, you know, like it's unlikely that we're going to go from Homo sapiens sapiens to some else. Like it's going to take a long time. But if we get to that stage of the android, you know, figure out the brain, man, that will be so magical. Like all those dreams about can you fly? Can you, you know, jump uh, as high as like three floors? Or can you, can you, you know, even like basic things like losing weight or control, you know, your urination. all those are possible with stimulation because you know often times you realize and especially a lot of people who've got these injuries tell me that come to know that our arms our limbs everything else, it's just mass there is it's just matter there is nothing more to it it's the brain and the spinal cord and of course the heart that that makes us what we are because you know the moment your brain stops functioning any of the nerves in your arm stop functioning 
the rest of the arm is just is 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 this matter I mean, you know alternatively if you are able to use a prosthetic arm or an exoskeleton or even a jetpack for you know I, i'm throwing out ideas like audacious ideas but it's possible and I, we're starting out like we're still at you know one percent maybe two percent but you know it's it's possible like we, we could do it definitely like that's the future is super exciting and that's why right oh, all of us I, I I just want to read out Tom's commentary. He says, "If the brain was simple enough for us to understand, we would be we would be too simple to actually. It would be too simple for us to actually understand it." That's it's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. It's yeah. a it's a it's a beautiful quote. You know, there has to be some magic to life. I agree, but I'm sure by the time like we cross over to the next evolution, I'm sure uh, you know there'll be some some other matters. But uh, yeah, you know, exciting stuff, right? Like, uh, thank you, thank you so much. And I think the first time we also had <laughs> some Canadians over here. Like, that's very exciting. And the whole mission of the community is to get all of yeah. all of them into one single platform. Like, the professors yeah. are interested in India, and now clinicians are getting together, so we can get all of them into a platform and sort of rapidly progress the field of neurotech in India. So this one startup sure. can open a way to a lot of other startups. a lot of other academic researchers in neurotech and hopefully as an indian ecosystem we can definitely do it and be one of the forefront leaders in neurotech yeah, yeah that's yeah, that by the absolutely. way uh, thank you very much kartik organizing such a wonderful event yeah thank you thank you for being sure and yeah. hopefully we'll have a lot of interesting events let's follow meet up and you'll be getting updates on we'll have we're planning to have like one in two weeks events and already the next week speak i mean The next speaker is also about to get confirmed, so that'll be an interesting feed, like speaker from UCLA, I hope. So yeah, hopefully, yeah, we'll we'll have a wonderful time at Neurotech X India for sure. Awesome, that's great. Thank that's you. great. Thank thank you, thank Deepak, thank you for your kind comments. And and, and, like, and also uh, just a moment of thanks for uh, Neurotech X India, Neurotech globally. Tom, I'm sure like it must be it must be an odd time of the day for you, but you still attended. So thanks for doing that. Uh, everyone else on the call like uh, have a great weekend and thanks for joining in by the way i i'm not sure uh, just just last comment by the way i'm not sure if you guys know there is a slack channel right on a neurotax uh, mm-hmm. uh i think that is quite yeah that's quite amazing slack channel so if you wish to join you can get lots of you know interesting information there definitely yeah. i think you can see that on the neurotech x website you can just log in the slack channel and if you log in the slack channel you'll see hashtag india channel So definitely, I would recommend all of you to join that to get updates, and we can have some discussions within the India channel. So every chapter, every country has their own channels. So yeah, that will be very interesting. And thank you so much for that information, uh, Mr. Bupendra Mishra. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, we'll have a lot of like good time together. And we also have a lot of events and webinars planned. Like getting a plan to get all the the whole Indian ecosystem onto one webinar. Professors, clinicians, students, engineers, and that's one plan. And also to get like global speakers there's one more event is going to be planned so hopefully yeah, we're going to have a lot of wonderful time spending with our brains yeah awesome bye thank you awesome. thank you so much right. thank you thank you all thank you thank you bye now bye tom yeah thank you bye all of you bye.